Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hi, you guys. Before we get into the episode today, just a quick reminder. If you are somebody who loves conspiracies and if you are somebody who loves learning about secret societies, and things that are done in the shadows. We have a really great panel of speakers that we're putting together on Gnostic TV. As you guys know, Gnostic is a supporter of this channel of Esoteric Atlanta. And I myself have two series that I work on on Gnostic TV as well. I provide content too. That's the Esoteric Explorer series and the Esoteric Health and Wellness series. Now we have again this panel and it's a bunch of really big people who have come out of the occult, people who were raised in these crazy, I have to watch what I say, these secret families. You guys know it starts with an I and it ends with a nate. I, not, you know what I'm saying, right? The I word. Um, anyway, they were raised in the occult and they have now escaped and they are whistleblowers and they talk about their experiences growing up with the magic and the arcane, the magic, everything that they learned to do as children. We also have people who our researchers into the occult and this panel is a bunch of speakers exclusively talking about their experiences what they've learned and sharing with you all the juicy details of what goes on in the shadows of our world if you would like tickets to this panel you can text the word event to 321-216-8047 that's event to 321-216-8047 all that information will be down in the description box below this event, this panel is happening online, again, on Gnostic TV, so it's okay for anybody anywhere in the world to get tickets to. You will just have access. There won't be a start time or an end time. Once you get your, your ticket, you'll have full access to all of the interviews and all the conversations. If you are texting from a country outside of the United States, make sure you put plus one, 321-216-8047, again, again, sending the word event to 321, plus one, 321-216-8047. And you will be texted a code in order to get your ticket into this event. All right, you guys, let's start the show. Hey, you guys, editing Bryce here. Just a quick note before we get into the show. The pirate that we are talking about today is a man named Jean Lafitte. Now, in this episode, you're going to notice that I interchange Lafitte with Lafayette. And that is just a mistake on my part because I am also working on another person, the Marquis de Lafayette, for next week. And so that's just a tongue slip. But please know in advance that his name is Lafitte, not Lafayette, Jean Lafitte. Anyway, guys, enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today is our third installment over um, the Book of Daniel, written by Stephen Pesor, that deals with the big conspiracy um, regarding this family. Now, I am this. This episode is the episode that I'm probably the most excited about because we are going to be talking about a very famous pirate today and how this pirate connects to this particular family. In fact, I'm so excited about doing this. My hair is a little wild because I wasn't actually planning on recording today. I was just going to research today. So I didn't really do my hair. And then I was just so excited to talk to you guys about this that I decided to just go ahead and film, throw some makeup on and film anyway. So please excuse my hair. It's kind of a mess. But nonetheless, if you are new to this channel, I know that this 
controversy, this conspiracy regarding the Pesor family is a huge topic. And I know so many people have so many different opinions about this particular family. Again, the one thing I ask is that you please be respectful to each other in the comment section. None of us know the full truth, right? We can recognize patterns, but we don't know the full truth. And so we always need to remember to take everything with a grain of salt. And to remember to treat people with the respect that we expect to be treated with as well. Just because somebody descends from a royal family member does not necessarily mean that they themselves are involved in any type of shenanigans. Just because a family is wealthy and owns a bunch of businesses does not necessarily mean that they are involved in shenanigans, okay? So, so I just want to put that out there just because they're a particular bloodline means nothing either. Remember, every single human being has free will and free choice. So please be respectful to everybody in the comment section. Please don't judge people solely on their last name. Judge people by their actions that they themselves take. Because again, we all have free will choice. And we all have people in our family line, judge not least you be judged. We all have people on our family nine, line that we are probably not very proud of. All right? So if you don't want to be held accountable for shenanigans and nastiness that one of your answers, ancestors got involved in, then don't then hold other people accountable for things their family's been involved in, if that makes sense. I know most of you guys know what I'm saying. I also um, remember, again, that these are all opinions. Even your theories are opinions. So please try not to state things as facts, you know, because we don't have all the information. We're, we're all, we're, this is all just one big speculation. That's it. Now, again, I will give a quick recap because we are going to be talking about Jean Lafitte, who is a huge pirate, um, from the southeastern United States. And we're going to talk a little bit about, before we get into Stephen's book and his research, I am going to give a little bit of a backstory on pirates and the southeast. Because with Jean Lafitte, there is speculation that this man, this pirate, did fake his death. And for me, I'm always very skeptical about people saying people have, yeah, I'm very skeptical about that. But with Jean Lafitte, I do believe that this man actually did fake his death, but we're going to get it. Let's recap first, and then we'll get into it. So if, if you're new here, I'm going to be placing our prior two episodes down in the description box below, um, or I can just recap it quickly for you. Totally up to you, up to you. You don't need to necessarily go back and listen to those episodes first. You can start here if you want. Absolutely up to you. So basically what we have with this uh, P family, we're going to be, I'm going to be careful. I'll say the name a few times, but we know that that name is very, con it's very, it's a trigger word for the algorithm. So I'm going to be very careful about dropping that name too many times. But we have this particular family. They're from North Carolina. And the legend is... The conspiracy is that this family is one of the puppet masters that are pulling the strings in all of our world affairs in the establishment. And so even though the, the Pesor name is not a big name that a lot of people know, the origins of this family having this much power allegedly, again, according to the conspiracy, do come from a royal family. And that family is the House of Bourbon. So this is the royal family that was on the throne when the French Revolution happened. So basically, when the French Revolution happened, Marie Antoinette, who was the queen at the time, she was a Habsburg, her husband, Louis XVI, who was the king of France, and their two surviving children, Maria Teresa and um, Louis Charles, were taken into uh, custody. We know that Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI lost their lives. They were guillotined by the people. Again, I've said it before, I'll say it again, no one throws a revolution like the French people. <laughs> they created a whole freaking guillotine for, for their revolution. So if I was a French politician, I would be I would be a little more humble about the fact that the French people, they're savage when, when it comes to revolutions. But, and we know there was, a, I mean, a lot of stuff was going on during the French Revolution. A lot of what's mirroring now, people were very poor. They were struggling. We have, you know, Victor Hugo's book, Les Miserables, which is one of the best books ever written. And of course, the play Les Mis, based on this struggle that was happening between the common person and the nobility. So nonetheless, very, very violent. To the Louis Charles himself was like eight years old, very young when they were taken into captivity. So once their parents were um, executed, because Louis the 16th was no longer alive 
His son then automatically became Louis the Seventeenth by French law. Now the problem is that the French Revolution was happening, so the people did not want a monarchy, which I agree with that. There should not be a monarchy. I absolutely agree with that. I don't know if I would go about it the way that they went about it, but there should not be a, no human being is is better than another human being. No no human being has more value because of a bloodline to to another human being. That's just that's just bullshit, right? But anyway, we have these two children. With that being said, though, with that being said, though, Louis Charles and Maria Theresa were children. They were children. And in my opinion, children are innocent. It doesn't matter. They're innocent. They're children. They need to be taken care of. They need to be supported. They need to be loved. They need to be healed. It doesn't matter if they're nobility or if they're the peasant's kid on the street. They're children. They're innocent. And I will tip my hat to the French people for that because they did not... They did not unalive the children. And I can totally respect that because I think they, at that point, even though they were being very savage with these politicians and these monarchy and the, the, the this establishment, they kind of pulled back with the children. So what they did is, according to history, the mainstream narrative is that they sent Maria Theresa into exile, the daughter, because France went by a law, most monarchies did, not all of them, but where it passed through the men. So Maria Theresa was not much of a threat. Unless she grew up and had a son herself, she wasn't an immediate threat because she was the daughter. She was the princess. We have Louis Charles, who now is automatically Louis the Seventeenth because his father is unalived. He is being held in prison. So the they're holding him, trying to figure out what to do with him. Now, the story goes that in, in history, that he was basically given to a family and raised, uh, kind of broken of this idea that they, they, they worked with him to make sure he understood that he wasn't the king, but then he ended up getting sick and passing away anyway at a young age. But what we hear with this book and with this conspiracy is that there were a few people during the French Revolution who were royalist. They supported the monarchy. And so once Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI were unalived and this little boy, Louis Charles, was technically now Louis XVII, these royalists got the idea that for some reason or somehow they need to extract this eight-year-old boy from the prison, keep him in hiding, keep him safe until he is able to claim the throne again, until they can put him back on the, his rightful throne as Louis the Seventeenth. So they work this whole plot out with some of the prison guards, the laundress, um, and they find a cousin of Louis Charles through the Habsburg line, through his mother's line, that somewhat resembles Louis Charles. They're around the same age, but this cousin is very sickly. And this cousin probably is not going to live that long anyway. And so what they do is they claim that they're going to get a rocking horse for Louis Charles so that he has toys. Remember, he might be technically the king of France at this time, but he's still an eight-year-old little boy. So they're going to get a rocking horse. And they put, they drug the cousin. They put him inside the rocking horse. They take the rocking horse to the prison, pull the cousin out, switch clothes with them. So now the cousin is going to be wearing the Dauphin, the prince's clothes. And they put the Dauphin, Louis Charles, in the laundry basket kind of like they do in Annie where she gets in the laundry basket and they take him out of the prison. Now... Taking his cousin and forcing his cousin, a sick cousin, to live in the prison because he's going to die anyway is really heartless. Like, that's super heartless, and I, I do have issues with that if that was, in fact, what happened. But nonetheless, we can't change that if that's what happened. The cousin lives out the rest of his days under the assumed name of Louis Charles, where he ends up, again, passing away. And thus ends that particular line of the Bourbons. Their uncle does come back later on as Louis the Eighteenth, but that's a story for a different day. So we have this child that's being protected and guarded and guard guardianship by these people who are loyalist to the monarchy. And I mean, if you go back and listen or read the book yourself, he goes through some crazy stuff. Like this eight-year-old kid, his whole life is just trauma. Like he's in war, he's doing all these things. His protector passes away leaves Louis Charles with a, with a bunch of money. At this point, as legend states, Napoleon is now doing his thing. And they say that Napoleon caught wind that Louis Charles was actually still alive and that they were working with him to get him back on the throne. And so when they find out that Napoleon knows that Louis Charles is alive, they then send Louis Charles to the English court, which is King George and 
Queen Charlotte. So this is the same King George, Mad King George, that lost the American Revolution to the colonists, okay? And they say that Charlotte, Queen Charlotte, was Marie Antoinette's cousin. So there was a familial connection to Louis Charles. Now, with that being said, they did exhume the body of the supposed Louis Charles a while ago in France when this legend started to, to grow become more popular and more accepted and they did test this the, the remains of this child's dna and the dna did match the mitochondrial dna of marie antoinette however that doesn't mean anything so mitochondrial dna is the dna you inherit from your mother so it doesn't necessarily mean that he was he could have been he could very well have been that that could really well have been louis charles we don't know this is all speculation right by having matching mitochondrial DNA. However, it could also mean that this little boy was a cousin to Marie Antoinette and just inherited the same DNA through Marie Antoinette's sister or cousin or another female coming from the Habsburg line, if that makes sense. So like, it didn't really get him anywhere, right? This DNA test did not disprove or prove. All we know is that the, as at the body that was buried under the name Louis Charles is related to Marie Antoinette. That's all we know. We don't know, again, if it's a son or if it's a cousin, a nephew. We have no idea. Okay, so we're back at square one with that. But nonetheless, Louis Charles ends up in the court of England. Now, at this time, all monarchies are basically shitting their pants, okay? Because the English monarchy just lost the American Revolution. The French people just guillotined their rulers. So having this boy... Even though he's family in your court is dangerous. All right. So what they do, what they work out is they send Louis Charles with a man named George Pesor. Now, this George dude, he was almost like the way it's described is the weight master, which basically means he weighed the gold. So he was the accountant. Like he was the accountant. That's how I take it when I read the description of his job. He's the accountant for, he was for the royal family in France. And then he was up in England as well. And so he has close ties to the royal family. And so King George and Queen Charlotte of, of, of UK decide that they're going to send Louis Charles because Napoleon is after Louis Charles. They're going to send him to America, to the new founded United States, under the name Daniel Pesor, he's going to be George's son. All right. That's now Louis Charles doesn't exist anymore. He is now Daniel. All right. Now, with that being said, the United States, the newly formed America is not under British um, gar guardianship anymore. It's a different country. And so what they do, and I found this hysterical. I said this last week. We all fake, at some point, you watching, you probably faked your parents' signature. Well, King George did just that. So once the United States won its independence, there had been land grants that the King of England had given people who had come to America. And the newfound country of the United States of America said they would honor those land grants. So if it was post the American Revolution that the King of England had given you land, the United States government was like, we're going to grandfather you in. It's okay. You're not going to lose your land. It's fine. Okay. So what King George did is he forged a document under his father's name, the king before him, saying that George Pesor was to have this particular land in the state of what is now North Carolina. Now, we know this is a forgery. Historically, so this is something and it's it shows it in this book. We know this is a forgery because in this documentation, King George, when he's or the when they're talking about the land that they're going to give JP, uh, George Pesor, they give a county name and that county name was not in existence until after the American Revolution. So we know that's a forgery, but nonetheless, they send them, the, the United States government's like, whatever, take this land, it's fine. It's in North Carolina, more inland, more towards Appalachia. And so they're gonna be hiding Louis Charles under this assumed identity in the United States of America until they're able to remove him back to the throne of France, which never happens. But nonetheless, because this boy, this Daniel guy, is a bourbon is one of the ruling families he also starts to have children and so what tends even though he's not put back on the throne of france 
he's actually sitting on a more silent throne where he's puppeting the world now. And that's why people believe this particular family is one of the top of the, the pyramid people in our establishment. That's the story. What we do know for certain, these are the things we know for certain, is that there was, there is a Pesor family from North Carolina, a George and a Daniel. We have all that. Uh, Stephen is a descendant of this particular family. What we don't know for sure is if this particular boy, Daniel, was in fact Louis Charles. What we don't know for sure is, in fact, this family is, they're very powerful, very wealthy family, but that doesn't mean anything. Like if they're, you know, people can be wealthy and not be part of the nefarious establishment, right? Like people that, the two things can be true, right? So we, we just don't know any of this. So for sure. In this book, Stephen, his point in putting all his research together was to try to figure out if his ancestor was actually Louis Charles. So he doesn't even... At, at this point, it hasn't even mentioned um, any conspiracy or any type of, of, of government establishment, you know, you know, I'm trying to be careful about what I say, right? Because we're on YouTube. So so please be careful about what you say in the, in the in the comment section below. But nonetheless, this is the stuff that I freaking love. Because again, we don't know. This is all speculation. And we're looking for patterns in these stories that might exist and might not exist. You know, there's also a lot of confirmation bias. But nonetheless, as Aristotle said, it is a sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. So I am entertaining the idea that the this family is as nefarious as people say they are, but I'm also entertaining the idea that they're not, right? Because we don't have full-on facts yet. I want to clarify something again because I feel like I have to. Now, if you've been on this channel for a very long time, you know that we have talked about Tartaria and this, there's a speculation of an ulterior timeline. And that, that, that if this timeline is accurate, then perhaps the, the official history we've been given is not so accurate, right? It might, might not be true at all, um, especially if we're looking at the mud floods and all that kind of stuff. I'm ve very well aware of this. So you no need to like make these comments in the comment section. We are very, all the viewers of this channel are very well aware of the Tartarian timeline. However, again, it's a sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. So I'm entertaining both possibilities of the official narrative we've been taught in school and the alternative narrative. I'm also entertaining the possibility that both can be true somehow. All right. I feel like especially in this time of, of discovery and of awakening that it's really important that we don't go back to sleep meaning it's really important that we don't cling from one held belief to a new held belief and close ourselves off to all these other possibilities as we wake up and we realize we've been lied to we need to make sure that our mind stays opened a mind is like a parachute it works best when open all right. And just entertain these ideas without latching on to them as being absolute truth. The only absolute truth, you know, is that you are you. Right. And you, the only absolute truth is that you control yourself. That's it. Everything else is out of your hands. And so we're just speculating now again. So with that being said, don't worry about we're, we're not even going to entertain Tartaria right now. We're going to be talking about the official narrative while also understanding that there could be this could be all bunk anyway. So with that being said, let's talk about pirates in the southeast. Now, you guys, if again, if you've been with me for a while, especially since the very beginning of my channel, I have said many times very selfishly, there is nowhere else in the world that I would rather be from than the southeastern United States, the deep, the deep south. All right. I have traveled this world extensively. I have lived in India. I've lived in Europe. I've been to all four corners of the world, Australia, multiple times. I love other countries. I love visiting. I love the culture. But I am very partial to the southeast. The reason why I'm very partial to the southeast, because the southeast definitely kind of made me the weirdo that I am today. Because when we, a lot of people think of the southeast, they think of like, rednecks or hillbillies uh fundamentalist christians but that's not that's not what the southeast is like yes we do have those types of people but they're kind of a minority they're the louder ones but they're more of a minority and i will tell you guys you know who makes the moonshine the fundamentalist baptist they're the ones who make the moonshine so nothing is really as it seems when you look at the south okay nothing is really as it seems there's complexity here and there's eccentric behavior here 
Now, I've said this before. When uh, in the late 90s, there was a book that was published called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I've covered a lot of this on my Savannah playlist. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil was based on a true story. And it really uncovered a lot of the eccentric behavior of the South that people weren't familiar with. It uncovered how many people in the South uh, work with witch doctors and root doctors. Absolutely, we do. I've said it before. You'll go to church on Sunday morning. By Sunday afternoon, you're working with your witch doctor. Like, that's just a part of Southern culture, right? You love Jesus, but you also love your witch doctor and their voodoo, right? So that's just very much a part of the complexity of the South. Okay, and there's another part in the book. So it's all based on a true story. Where in the beginning, this reporter's in, from New York, like covering this case, this 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 murder case, and he he's talking about these these characters he's meeting in Savannah, and there's one dog that get or one guy that gets up every morning and walks his ghost dog, and I've laughed about this before because when they made the movie, they made a movie with Kevin Spacey, um, lots of big names are in that movie. My my, my mind's gone blank right now, but um, when that came out and they showed the ghost dog, I was a teenager and I was like. Everybody kept talking about this ghost dog moment about this guy who walks this ghost dog. And I remember thinking as a teenager, you you guys don't do that. That's not, that's not normal. Like you guys, what, like in your Connecticut town or Massachusetts town, you don't walk ghost dogs. Like I thought everybody walked their ghost dog. Cause that's normal. Like down here in the South, that's nothing to gawk out. That is normal that people walk their ghost dogs down here in the South. Like that's just normal. People talk to the ghost in their house. Everywhere is haunted. I, most of my friends, I grew up in a haunted house. Most of my friends grew up in a haunted house. The ghost in my house was a little bit more malicious, but I had friends who had very friendly ghosts and you go play at their house and the mom, you know, your friend's mom would be like talking to the ghost, like calm, calm down, be a little calm, quiet. You're, you know, you, it's part of the family. The ghost is just part of the family. It's like Casper, right? So this is part of the eccentricity of the South too. We're also looking at the story of pirates and pi I don't know if many people know this, but pirates have a huge, they're a huge part of our culture here in the Southern United States. Huge part. I covered the one of the black beard stories last week, but in, I'm gonna actually pull a map up of the Southeastern United States so you guys can see this, especially if you're from another country and this is new in formation for you, okay? Let me move this down a little bit. All right, so here's the Southeastern part of the United States right here. So I live right here in Atlanta, Georgia. I hope you can see my mouse icon. So when we're looking at the, the 1700s and the 1800s, what we have here on the Atlantic coast, we're going to go from North Carolina. So this is all considered the deep South. So North Carolina, where our story, a lot of our story takes place all the way down the coast to the South of Georgia. We're going to exclude Florida for a moment because during this time, Florida was not part of the United States. Although St. Augustine, which is right here, St. Augustine is one of the oldest cities in our country as well. So that's very important. American, it's a port. And when Florida got added, it's, it's a beautiful city if you're ever in Florida. So when we look at the, this coastline here in the, in the deep South, all of this coastline, I know you can't tell from this map, but there are tons of islands off the coast here, tons of islands, barrier islands, right? So what we have, it's very boggy. This area is called the Low Country because it drops. Actually, the Low Country cuts off at about the border of South Carolina and North Carolina. And literally, like if I'm going to drive from Atlanta to Charleston, so Charleston right here is where my mother's family is from, right there. So I go to Charleston a lot. So if I'm going to drive from Atlanta, you will actually feel around here, you'll, you're, you drop, like you feel it drop. We know New Orleans down here, which was another huge port, which we're going to talk about today with Jean Lafitte, uh, is below sea level. Okay. Now, at the point of our story that we're talking about, Louisiana, which is right where New Orleans is, in like 1805 or something like that, you guys can correct my date, 1803, 18, beginning of the 1800s, Napoleon, so the guy who was hunting for Louis Charles, sells the Louisiana to the United States government. So the United States government has just won its freedom. And we're going to talk a little bit about this, too, because we're going to get a little bit into the War of 1812, which was kind of the second American Revolution. So Napoleon sells Louisiana to the United States. Now, Louisiana was not. So this is what the state looks like today, this little boot. But at this time, Louisiana was a territory. So it it, it went all the way up to Canada. It was a huge territory. Now it's been divided into other states. So that was called the Louisiana Purchase. So directly following the American Revolution, Louisiana. 
whoops. Well, oh, Oh, maybe that's better. Maybe that's better. Maybe that was spirit guiding me to make it better. All right. Hopefully that's better. So um, Louisiana was uh, now right after the American Revo Revolution, it was annexed on to the American colony, the new country. It's still a part of the Deep South. Louisiana is very much still a part of the Deep South. Now, we spoke about this before. So we have these ports. So we have uh, New Orleans, Mobile, Alabama, which is right here. Then we have Charleston. We have Savannah. We have these big ports all over the Southeast where people, and we're not just talking about, when, I, when I'm talking about the ports, I'm not just talking about exporting of goods and importing of goods. I'm talking about immigrants coming into the country from Europe more specifically. Also, the slave trade was coming into these ports. Um, again, my I have one, I've talked about my grandmother's family, the Bennets or the Benets. They were French they lived in South Georgia, my grandmother, but they actually came up from New Orleans. They they were a French family that the Benets that came up from New Orleans and then traveled into Georgia because they were Huguenots. They were French Protestants, and so they were they were seeking to get into more English territory um, because they were Huguenots, and the English territory was more Protestant. The South Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. This is Tennessee. This is mostly Protestants. You very rarely will see a Catholic church. Louisiana, though, however, very Catholic. All right. So we can kind of see how these different personalities are playing out in the new the new world. All right. So when it comes to like the early 1800s, or actually let's back up a little bit, because Jean Lafitte, um, he was kind of a late pirate. So before the American Revolution, we had so many pirates. I mean, there were, I mean, that's the eccentric and eccentric sea of the South, right? Like, listen. Okay, before the American Revolution, Georgia itself was a penal colony. So Georgia was like the Australia before Australia was a penal colony. So all these people, and again, I don't have any roots in Georgia. My my, my I don't have any felons that are that were put in the penal colony. But nonetheless, a bunch of people, mostly from England because this was an English colony, were dropped off in Georgia, which is named after King George because they couldn't pay their debts, like they were in debtor's prison. So they say, now again, this totally contradicts Tartaria, because they're following along with Tartaria, then Georgia's actually Egypt, but that's, that's a story from another day. We're following the mainstream story at this point. So you have all these people who are brought to Georgia as a penal colony because they cannot pay their debtor's prison in the UK. Now, South Carolina, North Carolina, these are all actual settlers, like people who chose to come here. Now, what's very fascinating, again, about the Southeast, and you guys know this is no, no, no secret. Yeah, I talk about it. So many people talk about it. The Deep South is incredibly hot. And we're not talking hot, hot. We're talking hot, 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 humid, hot. Um, there's a great funny meme going around where people asking a question like, what's what's Atlanta like this time of year? What's Florida like this time of year? And the response is, have you ever been cremated? It's humid. It's muggy. It still is in 2024. And um, I put on my Instagram this English girl talking about how English heat waves are the worst than any other heat wave. And meanwhile, she has super thick hair that's down. <laughs> And she's wearing a, a shirt to her neck. And anybody who lives in a hot area of the world knows if I step outside, I got to pull my hair up and I can't wear anything on my neck because it's too hot. It's too. So if you're able to wear your hair, hair down outside, you have thick hair. You're not in a hot. You're not in a hot climate. OK. And no, honey, England, apparently the heat wave England is in right now. Another English person posted this. Um laughing at his own people because apparently the temperature of the heat wave that England went through is actually how we where the, the temperature we set our thermostats here in America for comfort. So with that being said, but with that being said, so keeping that in mind, England's way north, it's far away from the equator. A lot of these people that were immigrating to this area were from Northern Europe or England, and they're coming into an area that's extremely difficult to live in, right? We've got malaria, like hardcore malaria at this time. We have yellow fever, which is another um, kind of malaria-esque. It comes from mosquitoes as well. We still have horrible mosquitoes down here. Um, we have, we're dealing with alligators everywhere. I mean, this is all swamp plant on the coast, as well as in New Orleans, you're dealing with alligators. You're dealing with um, poisonous snakes, a lot of snakes. And then you go inland. So if you go inland, 
to like right here, you're getting into Appalachia. All right. We know we've been talking a lot about Appalachia. So you're dealing with black bears. You're dealing with all sorts of craziness that you're not used to dealing with. And so people, so the, the, the penal colony of Georgia, they didn't have a choice. They were stuck there. They had to learn how to survive there. But the people who chose to come, like my ancestors who came in through Charleston and actually stayed in Charleston for a very long time, they had to adapt very quickly. Man versus nature, nature always wins. In their petticoats, in the everything, they had to learn how to adapt to the heat and the demands of this area of the world. Um, they had to learn how to live in the bayou, in the swampland. They had to learn uh, how to be tough. So people in the Southeast are tough. They're tough people. You know, there's a funny, uh, there's a couple of funny TikToks of a guy. He's in the swamps and all these people are freaking out because this alligator puts its head up on his boat and this guy just pops the alligator on its, on his snout and says, go on now, go on now. Like that's a Southerner, right? Or have you guys seen that TikTok of that little Southern girl? They're up in the mountains and a black bear comes to their porch and she's like, I want to pet that dog. I want to pet that dog. And the parents are like having to grab her because it's a bear. It's not a dog. You know, that's just how we are in the South. It's just, it's, it, you have to survive. So people who are from the South, who have a long lineage in the South, like myself, like a lot of people who are watching right now, you come from really strong people really strong people. The houses, they had to learn how the old pre-antebellum houses are built in certain ways to catch the wind. That's why we have really tall ceilings. Like people talk about how high our ceilings are in the South, like really high ceilings in old buildings. And they don't have that up North. The reason why the ceilings are so high is because in the South, we had to stay cool. Not like they, the North, they have a winter. We don't have a winter in the South, right? So, so we are looking at this really intense, land that people have to navigate. Now we have a few cities. Again, Charleston was a booming city. My family lived in Charleston for hundreds of years. They lived in the city of Charleston for hundreds of years, but most people would come in and open up plantations outside of Charleston and then bring the product into Charleston to sell. We also have Savannah. So post the American revolution, Savannah is a very fun town. Um, Savannah looks like it's on the coast, but it's actually like Tybee Islands right there. You actually go up. Savannah is actually a river town. It goes up the Savannah River. And Savannah, again, I have a Savannah playlist. I'll I'll tag it down below. We can cover some of those stories again if you guys ever want to recap some of the Savannah stories. I love Savannah. Savannah is wild. It's like it's Savannah was like they have the river walk in Savannah. And the river walk now is a huge tourist attraction. There's a lot of restaurants, stuff like that. But back in the day, the river walk, which is on the river, obviously, it was brothels for sailors. So this was like a wild, wild west town on the East Coast where there was really no, no laws, Savannah, right? It was wild. So and then, of course, over at New Orleans and in, in Mobile, you have these, these ports where cities grew around these ports. So with that being said, most people lived in the farmland of the south most people were on plantations or up in appalachia only a few there were only a few cities atlanta wasn't established for a long time atlanta was not always this, the capital of this state and it was elizabethstown for a very long time it was just a railroad town until it became atlanta so with that being said we have all these europeans who have migrated to the southeast for whatever reason to the new world for whatever reason whether it's religious freedom whether it's to get away from the monarchy, just for a new start, to make their live their American dream. You've got these people who are dealing with obstacles and navigating obstacles that are not, they're not conditioned for. You know, if your lineage is from Northern Europe, you're not conditioned for the heat of the Southeast. So they're trying to adapt to, um, to the conditions in the Southeast to live and thrive and have a thriving life. But we also have pirates. We also have the pirates that are coming up and down the islands. And a lot of people who are from the Southeast are descendants of pirates, whether they know it or not. My boyfriend is a descendant of a pirate. He has all the information. His, his um, ancestor worked down in the islands. We have all the islands down here um in the caribbean and he would take boats and stuff from the from the english royal the monarchy down here and eventually he just gave his middle finger to the monarchy and he became a pirate and then came up to florida and met up with another half of his family and two of their kids got married and thus the, the line continued but up into this area of florida so a lot of us you might not even know it but you probably have some pirate in your genealogy 
and that was just it, right? You you just dealt with it. You dealt with the pirating. You dealt. This was the wild time in our normal history again, excluding Tartaria. So let's let's pick back up now with Jean Lafayette because oh, and again, I just want to remind you guys too before we get into it. So even though Louisiana was French and then Spanish and then French and then Spanish again, and there's a lot of French influence in in Louisiana today, they still have signs in in French. Um, there is just as much French in South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, we talked about this last week. Even though these are English uh, colonies, I have a lot of a lot of French in me. I'm mostly English and French with a little bit of German. Um, and that is because even though my last name's Watson, Bryce, my first name, my mother's maiden is my mother's maiden name, B-R-I-C. That's actually Brice. It's a French name. Benet, Bennett, my grandmother's. So a lot of these French people, and they talk. He talks about this in the book. There's a lot of French speaking people in South Carolina and North Carolina. And it's it's mainly, for the most part, it was because they were Huguenots. So they were Protestants. And so they came to a colony in the New World because the War of Religions in France was bloody. It was very bloody. And so they came to a colony in the New World that was owned by England because England was Protestant, right? So they, they had more freedom of religious practices without being nervous about uh, the Catholics, like in New Orleans. And so that's why there's so many French, so many French. My mother speaks French. Like my mother, you know, I don't. My, but my, my mother and her sisters had to learn. Like it, it's very, very, this is a huge French area. But I don't think a lot of people outside the United States know that. Okay. Of Charleston, the Ravenel Bridge. There's just so many. So, so the fact that a French kid would be sent to North Carolina and not New Orleans makes sense to me because there's a huge french community here it's not weird the locals aren't going to be like why is there a french family here no there's 20 million french families here so it's not going to be weird right they, they can be more inconspicuous here now jean lafayette was a and i'm not going to go super into detail with what i know about jean lafayette's life that we do know um, I'm going to just briefly go through his life uh, and then we're going to go through the book and what the book has to say about Jean Lafayette, the pirate and how he connects to, um, the Pesor family. But there is a lot. And the reason why I definitely think that there's some truth to this story with Jean Lafayette, the faking of his death and moving to North Carolina is because so many historians have done extensive research into this conspiracy. So we saw last week where the uh, French, government sent people to North Carolina from France to do some DNA testing on Peter Stuart Ney. You can watch that um, from last week. We won't get into that too much today. Um, but with Jean Lafayette, we definitely have a lot of speculation that he could have faked his death and then moved to North Carolina. And I'm going to put some links down in the description box, especially if a mother daughter pair that wrote a book on this and spent years researching and traveling all over looking for documentation to try to figure out if the legend in Lincolnton, North Carolina is correct, and that's where Jean Lafayette actually lived the rest of his life, under the name Lorenzo Ferrer, after he allegedly died as Jean Lafayette. So what, it's interesting, Jean Lafayette, like most pirates, um, what we do know, we do know, but there's a lot we don't know. So we don't know where Jean Lafayette was actually born. Some people think he was born in France. Some, think he, some people think he was born in Haiti. Some people think he was born in Louisiana. No one really knows. And he did speak both French and Spanish, which is normal at this time. Because remember, New Orleans, before it was sold to the United States, kept switching ownership between the French and the Spanish. So you've got both Spanish and French influence here in New Orleans. But nonetheless, Jean Lafayette ends up in the New Orleans area, in the bayous. And he is a pirate, okay? Okay. But he ends up working with a man named Pierre Lafayette. Now, even in this book, they claim Pierre is his brother. Obviously, they have the same last name. A lot of historians aren't actually sure, though, if Pierre was his brother or not. They, I mean, was Lafayette even Jean's last name? I don't know. Like, we, we don't really know these things. But nonetheless, Jean Lafayette, while he was working in, in, in the United States with his businesses, pirating, stealing goods. He was also one of the biggest slave traders. Um, so he was definitely into the business of humans um, when he was in New Orleans. And he was one of the 10 mo most wealthiest men in the United States while he was functioning in New Orleans as a pirate and as a businessman. 
Okay. I'm telling you guys, even though there were laws, laws at this time, especially in the Southeast, were just merely suggestions, right? So everybody knew who these gangsters were. There were a lot of gang there was a lot of gangster activity going on in New Orleans as well as Savannah. Not so much in Charleston, but Savannah had a lot of gangs and gang uh, gangster activity going on. Now, now Jean Lafayette, as far as like American history, was super famous because he helped Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. So the War of 1812 is kind of like the second American Revolution where England tried to come and take back America. Um, and so he really helped the Battle of New Orleans um, into Texas. He helped uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson ended up like forgiving the Lafayettes, uh, kind of, uh, you know, exonerating them of their crimes and pirating because of their assistance in the war and helping America win the War of 1812. So even though they were forgiven of their crimes after the war was over, they weren't as wealthy as they were before the war, but they still were pretty, pretty wealthy. Um, now, a lot of people think that Jean, uh, Jean Lafayette was either killed in the war or died of like malaria. Um, there's multiple different stories about where he's buried. No one really knows. And the, the, it's interesting. I was listening to the mother and daughter who wrote that book. Again, I'll put that in the description box below. Speak about this. And just the common sense of it all. And their mother was saying that when she was a little girl, even the encyclopedia wouldn't cover his death because they didn't know. They had no idea where this guy was. There were so many different conflicting stories about what happened to him, how he met his demise, that even the Encyclopedia Britannica was like, oh, I don't know. And it's not, I mean, so many different competing stories. Some people say he's buried in New Orleans. Some people say he's buried off the coast of Honduras. Like, and, and some people say Texas. Like, there's just so many different stories. And it's interesting. I'm going to paraphrase the conversation the mother and daughter were having where the mother said her daughter was like, you know, mom, if one of these stories is correct, then none of them are right. But how come, what, what, but what if I'm paraphrasing, what if none of them are actually, if we have all these different conspiracies about how he met his demise and they're all so different, then what if none of them are correct? And what if the conspiracy is actually true? The legend is actually true that he faked his death and ended up in North Carolina and Lincoln to North Carolina, which happened to be the same area as Daniel Pesor and Peter Stewart Ney, who they believed was Michelle Ney, Napoleon's general or marshal, right? So what they followed was paperwork around a man named Lorenzo Ferreira, who is the man that lived in North Carolina. And they found Lorenzo Ferreira in Mississippi when cotton got big after the alleged demise of Jean Lafayette, this Lorenzo Ferreira ends up in Mississippi with a 17-year-old uh, mulatto woman, so half black, half white, named Louisa. And they are working here. And then the same people, we trace their paperwork all the way, then they move up to North Carolina. Okay. And this is where our story picks up with Stephen Pesor. Now, I will place another link about Jean Lafayette in the description box so you can do your own research. I feel I kind of wanted to do this a little differently than most deep dives I do because there are so many people out there I've learned, with, the, especially with Jean Lafayette, that literally spend their whole lives tracking this this dead guy down, right? Trying to figure out what actually happened to him. And so um, I'm going to put all those links down in the description box below. I can't do it justice because I've only spent a few a few days looking into this and they've spent their whole lives. But to me, again, this is the whole reason why I opened up this freaking channel for this kind of stuff, because this is fascinating. Whether it's true or not, it's totally fascinating. So now let's get into Stephen Pesor's look at Jean Lafayette. So he writes the story of Jean, or excuse me, Jean Lafitte. I keep saying Lafayette because we're going to so Freudian. So we're going to, we're going to be covering Marquis de Lafayette next week. And so I keep, I keep, um, anyway, Lafitte, Jean Lafitte. I think I might have done that last week too because I was so excited about Lafayette. So Lafitte. The story of Jean Lafitte in Lincolnton is an intriguing one. In the 1820s, a man arrived in Lincolnton with a French accent and proceeded to buy up large tracts of property. He bought entire blocks in Lincolnton along with the land outside the city itself. One tract in particular was in the Long Shoals area. He identified himself as Lorenzo Ferrer. It seems that he paid for everything with gold coins, many of which were minted in foreign countries. So that's very pirate-like, right? There were many people who thought he may have been a pirate, and some who thought he was the pirate Jean Lafayette. 
There is a story that Farrah once encountered Peter Ney, who we spoke about last week, on the streets in Lincolnton. They conversed for a few minutes in French and both became very angry. They very near nearly came to blows, or perhaps they were ready to duel right there on the street. Acquaintance of both men separated them and both went on about their business. So, so far as it is known, this is the only encounter between the two men. And Peter S. Ney soon moved afterward to Rowan County. Speculation is that both French-speaking people were in Lincoln County for the same reason. The reason was to assist and to keep an eye on Daniel Pesor, the lost Dauphin. Their conversation apparently led to some disagreement as to who was in charge of the large task. Who was going to be his handler, basically? That's what we're talking about. Pretty badass. I mean, this poor kid, if this is true, this poor kid has been through hell and back. He's been put in a prison. He's had to follow somebody to a war in Egypt. He then was sent to the French court, then sent to America with a different name. Now he's got some alleged ex-marshal of Napoleon and a pirate trying to handle him. Wild, I tell you. That's some crazy karma, right? All right, so let's start that again. Their conversation apparently led to some disagreement as to who was in charge of the large task. Or maybe it was how the task was to be carried out. We may never know the full story. We do know that it is a really a major coincidence that two men of considerable means, both French speaking, both undoubtedly having military experience and, and able to take care of themselves should arrive in Lincoln County just a few years after George and Daniel Pesor arrived. Perhaps one or both of these men were charged with returning Louis the 17th, so Daniel, to France. Their motives are lost to history, but it seems unlikely. Both Frenchmen and Daniel live to ripe old ages, and there's no further evidence of any additional conflict among them. On January 28, 2001, Lincoln County, County historian Daryl Harkey was interviewed by the Hickory Daily Record newspaper in Hickory, North Carolina. Here's what he had to say about Lorenzo Ferrer exerted from the newspaper. So this is from 2001. So this is a historian talking about this situation even back in 2001. Okay. A brick wall between white people and those who were thought to have even one drop of African blood in them divides the cemetery. Because of the racial division, Louisa Ferrer and her white husband, Lorenzo, were not buried side by side. Lorenzo was thought to be a pirate and came to Lincolnton mysteriously one day and started buying up entire streets and buildings in the 1820s. So let me back up. There's something I, I did not, I forgot to tell you guys. So they, all we know is Jean uh, uh, Lafitte disappeared or met his demise in like 1823. That's all we know. So the 1820s, so we, we've got we've got accurate dates here that we have like the 1820s, Jean Lafitte disappears. He's a, a supposedly passed away. And then this guy, Lorenzo Frere, shows up in North Carolina. And people are thinking already that he's a pirate. Listen, if you're used to seeing pirates, which these people were, these let me let me rephrase that. The people in the South knew exactly who the pirates were. They knew exactly what to look for in behavior and mannerisms when it came to pirates. Pirates were all over this area of the world. A lot of people were descendants of pirates. So the fact that he came into town, they were like, he's a pirate. That does speak by, uh, volumes to me. That They weren't just like, it's because he's French. No, they were like, dude's a pirate. He probably walked. I, I keep seeing Jack Sparrow in my, in my head. You know, dude's a pirate. And he's paid with things in gold coins with, with foreign countries mint minting them. Come on. Come on. Right? All right. And the fact that he has this 17 year old Louisa wife of his, we don't know if they were actually legally married because if she was a mulatto, if she was half, it would have been against the law to marry her. So and the fact that he was heavy in the slave trade, just just very interesting. OK, so he goes on to say he spoke the language of sailors. He had a potty mouth. He had in his possessions more gold and silver than one could have accumulated in 20 lifetimes. He had in his possessions the loot that gave the impression of ill-gotten gains, said Harkey. In the 1920s, this mysterious man shows up in Lincolnton and buys whole blocks where my office is, Westwater Street. Lorenzo apparently bought property where the downtown's apartments are, South Aspen Street, and large farms near Hickory Gove community and along Shoals community. Then he bought a slave for $1,000, a large amount when the average man made 50 cents a day. 
Despite suspicions about the origins of Lorenzo's money, Parkey said he was good to people. People around town liked him. Parkey said he left town and came back with a woman named Louisa, who was part black. Lorenzo wanted to marry this woman, but law forbade it during the time. Lorenzo offered the Episcopalian church a large sum of money, but he was declined. Rising above the social strains of the age, the interracial couple had a son together. Everybody fussed over their son, according to Harkey, since he was an adorable child. Instead of feeling proud, it angered Lorenzo, and once he took his son's face and put it directly in the pit of a fire, the child survived, survived but was forever scared. Slaves were your property and children were too, explained Harkey. Louisa was popular in town and was talented, educated, and a beautiful woman, said Harkey. People in town loved her, but she still wasn't white. She died at the age of 40 and has an elaborate tombstone dedicated to her. Lorenzo has an even more elaborate tombstone, a larger tabletop monument with six legs. Alfred Nixon wrote a small book or pamphlet in 1910 entitled The History of Lincoln County. In this book, he had this to say about Lorenzo Ferrer. An old Frenchman in Lincoln County, Lorenzo Ferrer, often bought farm products from Mr. Kuhn and so admired his perfect integrity and full measure of potatoes. And one of his bequests was, I will and bestow to the honest George Kuhn $100. That was a lot of money back then. Sorry, guys, there's a lot of typos in this because it's self-published. So Lorenzo Ferrer, having been introduced, shall have a place in this history. He was a native of France, but spent his long life from early manhood in Lincolnton. He died August 6, 1875, aged 96. He had a coffin made to order and gave directions concerning his grave. Now, the fact that this, in the history of Lincoln County, they're saying that he was from France, that could have been the story that Lorenzo Ferrer gave. And Jean Lafitte, if they are the same person, could very well have been born in France. We don't know. That's one thing we don't know. Some people claim France. Again, some people claim Haiti. Some people claim New Orleans. We don't know where Jean Lafitte was born. And there is a possibility that Lorenzo Ferrer wasn't Jean Lafitte. I think he was. I think there's overwhelming circumstantial evidence that it's safe to speculate he was Jean Lafitte. But when you're creating a new identity for yourself, you're going to have to create a backstory. So the fact that Lorenzo Ferrer claimed to have been born in France doesn't necessarily mean that's where Jean Lafitte was born. All right. It is marked by a recent slab supported on mar marble columns. The first paragraph of, of his will was in these words. I, Lorenzo Ferrer, here write my last will and testament whilst I am possession of my faculties, as I have shortly to appear at the tribunal of St. Peter at the gate of eternity, when St. Peter is to pronounce according to my merits or demerits for our Lord Jesus Christ, entrusted the key of heaven to St. Peter and enjoined him to admit that deserving to enter into heaven and enjoy an eternal happiness, but to condemn the understanding defrauders to the everlasting flames in the devil's abode. We don't write like this anymore. <laughs> kind of makes me sad. When I sit down and actually write my will, I think I'm going to make it as, as flavorful as Lorenzo or Jean Lafitte wrote his Wrote, wrote his will out and i like that in possession of my faculties like next time i go drinking with friends i'm gonna be like when i lose possession of my faculties take me home because <laughs> i love this this is fantastic therefore i am endeav endeavoring to comfort myself in such a manner in order to merit an eternal happiness in the presence of god and his angels and in company with saint peter saint titus and other saints for i am anxious to converse with those martyred saints and rejoice with them at the firmness, patientness, and willingness they endured at their martyrdom for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am also hope to see and embrace my kind and honest friend, Michael Hoke, William Lander, and other good friends and honest friends with whom I have enjoyed an eternal felicity. If some of my friends watching die before me, I'm going to put that in my will. <laughs> Be like, I hope to enjoy eternity with my friend, Mary Sue, whatever. You know, like that's hysterical. So anyway, that's it. That's his part of his will. 
The life of Jean Lafitte is a mystery. No one knows for certain where he was born. Again, at various times, he was said he was born in what is now Haiti, Bordeaux, France, and other places. There are several things, however, that are certain. According to Lafitte himself, he was not a, pri a pirate. He was a privateer. <laughs> I'm not in the mafia. I just own a sewage company that makes no money, but yet is worth tons of money. <laughs> it was said that if you called him a pirate, you were likely going to have a fight on your hands. He did aid, aid Andrew Jackson, another Carolina native, in the Battle of New Orleans against the British during the War of 1812, operating out of the Barataria Islands in the Gulf of Mexico. He made a very good living gathering booty from British ships. A pirate. That's what pirates do. That's what my, my boyfriend's direct ancestor, Peter, did too. He was gathering booty from British ships. when the, He worked for the monarchy and they pissed him off. So he was like, I'm going to be a pirate and I'm going to take all your stuff. So I love it. I love it. He made a very good li living gathering booty from British ships. And some say importing slaves after their importation was outlawed by the u.s government Pre president james madison granted La lafitte a full pardon for all his crimes he had committed for his service during the war of 1812 which we've already covered that in 1819 he disappeared from history or so some believe some say he died in columbia south america some say illinois some say texas some say louisiana in the 1940s a diary surfaced in texas purported to have been lafitte it appeared to be authentic and Many first-hand references to events in Lafitte's life. It seems that Lincoln County, North Carolina, can make a good case as any as any that Lafitte lived there. An interesting note about Lafitte is his connection to Freemasonry. They're all Masons, y'all. It cannot be said for certain that he was a Freemason. His brother Pierre, his partner in privateering, was definitely a Freemason. However, both brothers, it seemed, always lived in areas where there was active Freemason lodges. Well, again, we said this last week. I don't think that's really a fair speculation because there are active Freemason lodges everywhere, right? So I don't know if that really means anything, but I wouldn't be surprised. Although I couldn't see a pirate actually following the rules that somebody else puts out in front of him like the Freemasons. I mean, that's why people became pirates because they were like, screw this. So anyway... This seems to connect the Freemasons very strongly with Lincoln County. Lafitte and Peter Ney both had strong connections to that society. The conjecture is also that George Pesor was, was also connected by way of his membership in the Nine Sisters Lodge in Paris, which we spoke about last week. Here is a painting of Jean Lafitte. Very handsome man. Everybody in my family is blonde and blue-eyed. So I got a thing for the, the dark hair and the dark eyes like that because not that's that's not in my family at all i laugh so hard you know my sister just had it i do i have a new beautiful nephew matthew um and he popped out like not looking like his siblings at all we'll see because my babies change you know but all of my sister's kids well jacqueline my oldest niece looks very italian my sister married a, a man my brother-in-law is half italian his mother's from italy he's very dark dark hair um blue eyes though so all of my sister's kids all have blue eyes because they're both blue eyed but my oldest nephew charlie and my youngest niece may <laughs> i thought for sure all of my sister's kids would pop out dark like with blue eyes but dark hair when i say dark i mean like dark hair um we were pretty olive skinned but i thought for sure because that's the more dominant gene and we've never had that in our family like all of our babies are like toe-headed like all, all both sides of my family just blonde 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 blue-eyed blonde like so so anglican looking oh uh, actually i shouldn't say well french, mostly my french french were blonde hair like when people native to the british isles actually the native genetics to the british isles are brown hair brown eyes uh blonde hair blue eyes comes from continental europe french and germany but um but when my sister married Stephen, I was like, oh my God, we're going to have like babies with like thick black hair. And no, just one. Charlie and May, my, my youngest niece, May, are literally, she's literally toe headed. Like her hair is so blonde. Those Anglican genes are very strong. But Maddie, my nephew, he, my new nephew, he looks like he might be darker too. He, he looks like his, his hair might, he might be a little bit more Italian, but we'll see. So I, I have a thing for that. That's a, uh, and a pirate, like, Although he didn't seem like a very nice guy, I will say, because what he did to his son. But 
different times, right? All right, the connection can not be drawn conclusively. However, it is a curious set of circumstances that several people with French connections were living in Lincoln County at the same time and at the pur pur purported exile of King of France, Louis the Seventeenth was also so he's what he's saying here is that it's not weird that there were a bunch of french people living in the area at this time what is weird is that a bunch of french people moved into the area at the time of the pesos that's what's weird not that they were if they were already there or came a little bit after like that's a different story because there were already a bunch of french people there but the fact that these big french people that were even back then were rumored to be not the people they claimed to be at the time that this pesor family moved in is strange and i will say that is a little strange because this is not a big this is not a big town this is a small town right it is all it is all very interesting that all these people were connected to in some way with the freemasons it would seem that such a strong set of coincidences would stretch the imagination at least as, as much as the story of daniel k so so that's jean lafitte next week we'll get into the marquis de lafayette I want to hear, okay, if you guys are from the southeastern United States and you got pirates in your bloodline, let me know. I want to hear those stories. Again, this is why I started this channel is for these crazy conspiracies, especially evolving around the southeast. Who knows? We know Jean Lafitte was a pirate. Sorry, dude, you were. You were a total pirate. We know that um, he has a very mysterious demise. We know that coincidentally, this other dude who probably gave pirate vibes <laughs> showed up in north carolina <laughs> soon after the demise of la lafitte of jean lafitte he was wealthy so wealthy that people were whispering he had to have gotten this from ill-gotten gains so i don't know was he a handler was he working for the french government or let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below uh, if you've gotten this book yourself, let me know. I'm excited to keep moving forward. Again, next week, we'll look at the Marquis de Lafayette. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a good day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.